There was a town, if you could call it that, named Brimstone, a small railway stop on the edge of the hottest deserts in the Southwest Territory. Barely a speck, it didn't even show up on most maps. That is, until they found the dark stone. Digging in the hills, an old prospector came across a strange nugget he had never seen before. A black stone partway between a crystal and a metal ore. But there was something special about that rock. It had a glow that you could only see out of the corner of your eye and was warm to touch. It had properties folks said were magic, and of course, that caused a stir. Within days, they found more of it buried in the earth, and stories started to spread. Businessmen and scholars started offering top dollars for even the smallest shard of the stuff, and that opened the floodgates. It was a gold rush, but not for gold, for the black rock, the dark stone. People came from all over to try and make for their fortune, and brimstone boomed overnight. They dug mines in every scrap of land they could get a hold of. Round the clock, they worked, digging deeper and deeper into the earth, bringing up cartloads full of the rock and sending it back to town to be stockpiled and sold to the highest bidder. What they didn't know, what nobody knew, was that as they collected more and more of that black rock all in one place, it started to react until it exploded. In a flash, the town was consumed and a shock wave rolled out across the desert, burning the trees and tainting the land. Reality itself was being ripped apart and the people along with it. Dark portals to other worlds started tearing open across the countryside, pulling people in and unleashing all manner of demons and creatures into our world. Wherever there was dark stone, these gateways would appear, some only flickering open for an instant, others opened and stayed that way. That was six months ago. Since then, demonic creatures of all kinds have been pouring out of the mines, and the scorched hell on earth that is, was brimstone. The government denies its existence, and anyone sane stares clear of the whole area. But plenty of folks find they can't help but be drawn in, whether it's to try and help somehow or just to find a fortune of their own. It don't matter. Everyone wants to be a hero. The damn fools. No one ever escapes. The Shadows of Brimstone. Hello everyone, welcome back to the next playthrough of Shadows of Brimstone City of Ancients. This is a cooperative dungeon crawl type game. It's an old west horror for one to four players. Currently, there are two core sets of the game in the market. One is called the City of Ancients and the other called Swamps of Death. The two sets pretty much place the same, but have different themes. The core set that we'll be playing today is, as you can see, the City of Ancients. Before we start, I do want to caveat that this is a big game. There's tons of components. There's lots of rules and lots of moving parts. So I, I assure you there would definitely be mistakes. Kindly call them out in the comments and I would add notes to, and annotations to the video so that we are on the same page. The rulebook has excellent instructions on how to set up the game. Basically, you want to decide on the number of players slash heroes. So in this game, we'll be playing through two heroes, one here, one here. You want to bring out all the card decks and just set them aside like so. You want to prepare all the tokens, which I have in the plano. And you want to ready your heroes following the character setup rules in the book. Allow me to introduce you to B the Saloon Girl. She is this lady, very nice looking. She has some starting abilities, which I'll go into later because it won't make a lot of sense right now for me to tell you about them. Uh, and just basically on the character sheet, there's a bunch of stats, her ability, there's some numbers on how much she has to roll to hit. Uh, her health is 11 and sanity is 20. Now my characters are at level two because I play two adventures with them. And during the adventures, you'll get experience points. Uh, when you reach a certain threshold, you will level up and get new abilities. So these, ab these characters are a little bit stronger than the ones out of the box, just because I've played two games with them. They're not that much stronger. There's, I think, eight levels in the game. They're currently level two, uh, but that 
leveling up and the things that happened over the course of the previous adventures has increased Saloon Girl B's health to 11 and Sandy to 20, as well as her combat to 3 instead of 2. When you create your character, you get to choose from 3 starting abilities. And these are things like all your attacks are plus 1 damage, you may move through other models, once per turn you may reroll some things. So they're very very powerful skills. At the beginning of your character setup, you pick one and the other, the other two goes back into the box and you'll never see them again. So be careful, be very careful selecting these abilities because you cannot turn back. For B, I've selected all her attacks are plus one damage. She also started with a personal item, which really creates some more personality to B. And you draw one from the deck and she got a worn eye patch, which makes her a little bit more cunning. She starts out with a holdout pistol, which she's still using, and uh, it's a ranged weapon. And finally, through her previous adventures, she acquired an artifact, which is this teleportation bracelet. I'm sure it'll come into handy in our next adventure. Each character gets one of these side bags, which can hold up to five tokens. And these are the types of tokens that are in your bag like dynamite, herbs, whiskey. These are things that would help you throughout the adventure, either in healing you or creating damage. Uh, we also have something called a grit token. These are kind of like clue tokens in Arkham Horror where you use them to reroll your dice um, and they also allow you to move a little bit more should you need them to do so. Last but not least, because we're playing a two-player game, there's some scaling involved, um, which is in the rulebook, but it says with two heroes, you get one revive token for your adventure, which is basically a surge type of token. When your heroes get, are killed, you basically just use this token, recover all of the hero's stats. Our second hero is the Bandito. His name is Chase. Chase you can see that again, once again, he has the stats here. He's, he's a bit slower on the initiative. He has initiative three and he has an ability which allows him to recover the grit um, when, you, when he moves. Once again, Chase is also level two. He has some upgraded stats, 19 health, 11 sanity, and his max grit is three. As for his starting ability, the Bandito, he has the ability that allows him to fire two single-handed weapons, guns actually, per turn with no penalty for the offhand gun. What that means is when you're rolling for attacks, if you roll a six, it's called a critical hit, which is a bit more, actually a lot more powerful than a regular hit. The penalty for when you're using both hands to shoot is that you don't get critical hits on rolling a six. So this ability allows him to hold two guns and if he rolls a six trigger that critical hit. So that's very helpful. In terms of his weapons, he started with a pistol. He also acquired this artifact called the judge, which is, which is awesome. I just got this in my town visit and it allows him to shoot three. So roll with three dice essentially. Uh, he also uses a D8 to roll instead of a regular D6 and six, seven, eight counts as a crit. So very powerful artifact and I'm really looking forward to using this for Chase in the next game. Finally, his personal item that he drew at the beginning of character creation is the Adventure Boots, which gives him plus one agility and plus one move. I don't want to bore you with too many rules at this point. Before we get to the game, however, I just want to tell you about the mission that we're doing. We're doing a basic mission. It's called the basic mission number four. And you don't have to do these in any order. You can, you can just pick one and do it as you like. This mission is called a search party. What happened here is that somebody, some of the town folks went missing, probably kidnapped by the, the monsters in from the, from the mind. So we're going to the mine to search for the missing person. So, as it says, the mission goal is to organize your posse for search. You must find three clue tokens before it's too late to find them alive. Three clue icons, actually. 
Roll a d6 to determine who has gone missing. This will also determine the reward if you can bring them back alive. Let's roll and see who we are searching for. We have a 5. We're looking for the local dock. Last thing before I start, I promise you, I just want to show you this bookkeeping thing that I that you know one has to do when you play this game. There's a lot of things involved that you have to keep track of. I'm just going to show you what I've done here. It's just a basic table of Chase and B. Uh, you, I have entries for experience points, gold, dark stone, some of the key monsters that we can kill and get bounty for after the adventure. So I want to keep track of who killed how many. And at the bottom here, I have the mutations, items, and abilities. So I can remind myself what are the things that um, I've, I've upgraded to or acquired in the past adventures. This is the mine entrance tile. To start, you place your hero on one of these spaces. So I've just put them here. A game turn works like this. The first thing we have to do every single turn is something called hold back the darkness. As you can imagine, demons and monsters are coming out from this mine. And so every turn we have to roll to see how far they've gone from the depths of the mine towards the surface. This marker represents the darkness. So they will move up over time towards the surface. And this marker represents our heroes and will move into the depths. Every time we explore a room, reveal a room, we have to move up like so. At the beginning, we would successfully pass the hold back the darkness roll if we roll seven or higher on the 2d6. But as we explore the rooms and go deeper and deeper, you can see that this number becomes eight and then nine. So over time, we have to roll higher and higher in order to pass the roll test. Also, every time we fail the roll, the darkness is going to move up like so. And you can see that there are certain spots here with the blood splatter and there are certain spots with the words growing dread. If the marker lands on the blood splatter space, we have to draw some bad cards called the darkness card. These are cards that add terrible things to the game. I hate these cards. When we reach the growing dread spot, we have to draw one of these Growing Dread cards and they affect our battles when we find, when we find and, and fight the end boss. Let's roll for our Hold Back to Darkness test. I rolled a 4 and a 6. So that's a fail because we have to roll seven or higher. We move this up to one. After we do the tests, models activate in initiative order. B has an initiative of five and Chase is three. So B gets to go first. The first thing you do on every single turn is roll for movement. And we rolled a five. Now, roll for movement is important. If you roll a one, you actually can only move one spot, but you also get a grit token. And as I said, these are very useful tokens, similar to clue tokens in Arkham Horror. They allow you to re-roll stuff. So even if you don't plan to move, you would want to roll the movement roll to see whether you get a one and whether you get the grit token. In this case, we rolled a five, so we get to move five spots. In this game, you can move diagonally, but you may not move through other models. Chase is here. She's going to move five. She has the fast ability as part of her character. So she has plus one move. That means she can move six spots. One, two, three, four, five, six. After you move, if you're not in a fight, you may search. There are two types of searching that you could do. One is called scavenging and the other is called looking through a door. You may do either of these things, but not both. Scavenging, I'm not planning to do it now, but to scavenge a map tile, you roll three dice. If any of the dice roll is a six, you have successfully scavenged the area and found something. 
you place a scavenge marker on the map to show that it may not be scavenged again and you draw one card from the scavenge deck for each six rolled. The scavenge deck, there's one third good stuff, one third bad stuff, and one third nothing. So it's pretty risky actually to go for the scavenge deck. At this point, I don't think I'll scavenge. Instead, I would do the other type of search action, which is looking through a door. Because B is on this open-ended puzzle connection, we may do the looking through the door action, which allows us to explore to see what's ahead of us. To do this, we go to the map deck and draw the top card. Through the door, B sees a summoning chamber. This green arrow shows where the connection should be made to our current tile. The next thing we do is we draw from the pile of exploration tokens Take the top one and put it face down onto this newly drawn map tile. And at this point, we won't be revealing, but this is to show that something we'll find something here. Now it's Chase's turn. He's going to start by rolling for his movement. He rolled a six. Chase's adventure boots gives him plus one, so he can actually move seven movement points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Actually, I'll probably just move him here to six. There is some strategy here in terms of how you position your heroes. As I said, models cannot move through other models, but they can move diagonally. If you place your characters like this, monsters can't move through you because they can't move through models. And if I had placed the Bandito Chase here, the monsters could have zigzagged through us and surround us. So in this way, if there's monsters here in our next exploration token, we ensure that these monsters don't, they don't have a chance to surround us. After models activate in initiative order, we go to the room exploration phase. If there were an unexplored exploration token, we now reveal it. The first thing we want to look at is this, these symbols here. These are door symbols. Because there are two of them, it means there are two exits to this room tile. In order to determine which exit, actually there's only <laughs> two exits, so we don't have to roll, but if, if, um, if there's more than two, we would have to roll a die, a d6, to see where the doors are. And as you can see, if you roll one, two, three, it would be here. And if you rolled four, five, six, it would be here. Since there's actually two doors, two exits to this tile, we um, actually leave this open. After that, you will look at the text. It says attack. That means monsters will come out. There are different levels of difficulty in terms of monsters. In a two player game, we, we only draw from the low threat deck. So let's see what's in store for us. We have void spiders and stranglers. This symbol means we have to roll something called a peril die, which looks like this. On the peril die, there are only threes, fours, and three, four, five, and six. So there's no one or two. And essentially what you have to do is you have to roll and see how many of those monsters you get. Let's see how many void spiders. We rolled a four, so four void spiders, and we rolled a five, five stranglers. I've put up the monster sheets, void spider and stranglers. There's a lot of information on these sheets, but the first thing we'll look at is the number here, the initiative. Void spiders have an initiative of six and stranglers initiative of four. To determine where the monsters go on the board, we actually start with the monster with the lower initiative, so stranglers. We place the monsters in a checkerboard fashion, starting with the spot that's farthest away from the entrance of this tile. So this is example in the rule book. This spot is farthest away from this entrance tile. And you start with the left hand side spot, then you checkerboard one, two, like so. And then you move down to the next row, starting from the left, three, four, five, and so on and so forth. In this case, 
this is definitely the spot that's farthest away from the entrance of the tile. So we'll place a strangler here, then checkerboard. So the next one would be two over. And then moving down to the next roll, it would be on this one here, 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 and there we've placed our five stranglers. Then we can move on placing the void spiders. Same thing, checkerboard fashion. Could be one here. And the final one is here. Notice that we do have some monsters on half of the space. The rule is that as long as it's standing on over 50% of the space, it can be legally placed. So these are legal placements. It's important to know that when you are in a fight like so, you may not search. So you cannot scavenge or explore further. You're pretty much stuck here, I guess, in these tiles that you've already gone through. Um, and you have to defeat them all before you can continue. As soon as the fight starts, it, it would end the turn that we were originally on. We would then go back to the beginning of the game turn, which starts with holding back the darkness. So we're going to roll for darkness. Five and four, so nine. Nine is greater than seven, and we're good. We do not have to move the darkness marker. After we hold back the darkness, models activate in initiative order. Void spiders have initiative of six, which is the greatest of us all, so the void spiders are going to go first. They will, like heroes, move and then do attacking. So the first move and their movement is eight. Enemies of one type are activated one at a time, starting with the model closest to the heroes. The first enemy model targets a random hero that they can reach. So this spider will activate either this, the bandito, or the saloon girl. One, two, three is B, four, five, six is chase. So it's gonna be B. When monsters move, they actually move as far as they can to the back so they can create space for other monsters to reach their, their heroes. So this spider, it would, you know, in theory, it would have wanted to go to the back of B, but it cannot move through the two heroes because of our careful planning earlier. So it would just move like so. The next closest spider, probably this one, doesn't really matter, um, is going to target a hero that has the least number of enemies locked on to it. So in this case, it would be Chase because he has no no enemies locked on. So it will go towards Chase and we'll continue moving the monsters like so. So go here, so go here. After the enemies have targeted our heroes and move, they will attack. The void spiders are nasty creatures that do melee attack. To see whether they hit us, they have to roll this combat value, which is two. So they get to roll two d6s, and if they roll a four higher, they would hit us. When they hit us, they would do two damage per hit. So let's start by rolling our two combat dice and see how many fours and higher we get. This spider is going to attack B. Ooh, double sixes. That's definitely greater than four, so we've got two hits. I should say two potential hits because we have a defense. So we have a defense of three plus. To see whether we can defend off the two hits, we have to roll two die for the two hits. And if we rolled a three higher, we would be able to block off uh, one or both hits. So beast defense is actually pretty good, three plus. And we've got three and a two. So this hit is blocked because it's equal to root and three. And a two, unfortunately, is a failed defense. So we do take one hit from the two hits that were dealt to us. As I said, the voice fighters is damage of two, so we will be taking two damage. 
The other spider will attack Chase. One and a one. Total miss. We don't have to roll for defense because it's, a, it's basically a miss. These two monsters can't attack, so that's it for the spider's activation. We'll now move on to the next highest in initiative order, which is B with her five initiative. The first thing she does is roll for movement. We have a three. I don't think she'll move, but as I said, we want to see whether we get the grit or not. She's going to stay put, and she will attack. Normally, you can do one attack per turn, but there could be other things that allow you to attack more in your equipment or abilities. In B's abilities and equipment, she her holdup pistol allows her to have a free attack once per fight. That's not one per, once per turn, it's once per fight. Yeah, let's uh, trigger that right now. Let's do a free attack. She has a range of three, that means she has no issues actually now uh, targeting an adjacent enemy, but normally you would check range if it's a range attack. And for shots, that, that's how many dice you roll. So she gets to roll 1d6. The whole of pistol also gives a critical hit on a 5 or 6. Normally it's just a 6, but the holdout pistol is on a 5 or a 6. So we're going to roll our 1d6 and see whether we get a hit on the spider. To figure out whether we hit or not, we have to look at our range to hit value. It says 2 hit, range 4 plus. So on our, on our d6, we have to roll 4 or higher to hit. Let's do a free attack. And we've got the four. That was a hit. The next thing we do is we roll for damage. Now we know it went through, but how much damage are we doing? And we did a six. It kind of gets trickier, and I was confused by this in the beginning, but what happens is you don't automatically deal six wounds to the monster. You actually have to look at the defense value. The defense for monsters work a little different from heroes. For heroes, we have to roll. Monsters, you don't have to roll for them, but uh, you look at the value and subtract the damage number by this number. In this case, it's a zero, so it doesn't, make, doesn't really matter, but if it were attacking a strangler and we did six damage, it has a defense of two, so we would actually just do six minus two for damage. In this case, spiders don't really have defense, so 6 minus 0 is 6, and, and 6 damage would go through. It only has a health of 3, so it is undoubtedly dead. Finally, you look at this XP number. When you defeat one of these small or medium monsters, um, there's usually a, an XP number here, and that's how much XP you get. For defeating the spider, we get 10 experience points. That's gone. We got 10, so we're now at 600. That was B's free attack. We're now going to do her regular attack. Again, I'm rolling this uh, hold up pistol, rolling for 1d6. And we rolled a 2. To hit, she has to roll 4 or higher, according to her 2 hit range number. So that's a miss. This is where these grit tokens can really come in handy. A grit token, if you spend it, allows you to re-roll that entire roll. So if you were, say, rolling three dice and you miss them all, you can re-roll all three dice. Or in our case, we've just rolled a two on the one die. So we could have spent the grit to re-roll this die. I'm not going to do that at this point. That's the end of B's activation. She rolled for movement, didn't move, and then she attacked. Next, we have the Stranglers, which has an initiative of four. These Stranglers will move up and target the hero that has the least number of monsters targeting it, which is B. So this Strangler will go one, two, three, four, uh, and then see this one. I think they'll all just move up like so. Stranglers, they have an easier time hitting on melee. They only need to roll three plus, and they roll four dice to attack. 
but their damage is only one if they get the hit through. We're going to now row for the three melee, um, actually this four combat dice. And that attack is for this strangler attacking B, four dice, we need three plus. All three of these are three plus. So uh, that's basically three hits. But the Stranglers has a special ability. Two hit rolls of six count as three hits each. This baby here counts as three. So three, four, five, five hits going through. B is going to roll her defense. Okay, so five hits. I'm gonna grab five dice. Her defense value is three or higher. We've got one five, and the rest of them are ones and twos. So we've got four hits going through, ouch. The damage for each hit is one. We're taking four wounds. B is already at six wounds. Next up, we have the Bandito Chase. He's going to roll for movement first. We have a four, not going to move. Chase is going to attack now. He is holding two weapons, one on each hand. So he actually can roll all of these dice added together, two plus three, which is five. His two hit number is five or higher, it's pretty high. So we're gonna need some luck here. Ah, don't forget this pistol here, the judge, he, it actually rolls a d8. And we get three shots. So we're gonna roll three of these d8s. I only have two d8s, so we're gonna have to roll one die again. Um, but here's two from the pistol, and then the d8s for the judge. Let's see what we get. Ooh, nice. Look at this. Wow. Very nice rolls. Six, seven, eights are crits, so we've got two crits. And then the six on the regular pistols is a crit as well, so actually three crits. The four is a miss because we need five or higher. So we've got three critical hits from, from one, one roll, that's really, really good. I'm going to re-roll the d8 and see what we get on the last shot. We got a five. Five is still a hit, which is not a crit one. In essence, we've got three critical hits and one regular hit. The interesting thing about the combat is that you can roll your hits and then assign your hits. And we know that we have three critical and one regular hit. Now we can actually assign and see based on you know your, the knowledge of what you have for the monsters, you can actually assign it to the various monsters. In this case, I know that the spider has zero defense, so I will assign the four to the spider uh, because critical hits will ignore defense. Because the spider has no defense, I'm not going to waste a critical hit on it. The four is going to the spider. We now have to roll for damage. This is just, you know, the fact that it's going through, but we have to roll to see how many damage is going to go through. So to the spider, we have four damage. Just so you guys are aware, these carols actually have equipped something called the Dark Stone bullet which adds one damage and this is something that I got in town between my last adventure and this adventure there's something in town at the blacksmith called dark stone bullets it has you know this cost here and what it does is it's a temporary you know ammo type of thing it lasts for one adventure all your gun hits are plus one damage because we were shooting some range attacks with guns our attacks are going to be plus one damage. We rolled a four, we had a plus one, so five, but the spider only had a health of three, so easily killed off. 10 experience points going to chase. We have three more crits to assign. The first crit is going to go to, let's do this strangler. We're gonna roll our d6 to see how many damage goes through. And it's a five. 
with our plus one, that's actually a six. So six damage going through. Let's look at its defense is a two. Six minus two is four. Four damage or four hit points going through. It only has a health of three, so it is also defeated. As a result, we're going to get 25 experience points. We have two more crits to assign. I am going to assign them to the Stranglers, this one and this one. Let's roll. Five and a four, wow, nice. So that's essentially a six and a five, which is, as we know, uh, is going to kill off the Strangler. So that's gone and that's gone. That's additional 50 experience points to Chase. Before I forget, Chase actually has an ability, which is part of his level up previously, uh, which says when he kills of an enemy, he can roll a die, and if it's a 5 or a 6, he can get a grit token. He just killed off 4 enemies. So, that's a lot of dice. And she, he got 1 6, so he's going to get a grit. He currently has 2 grit. This is going to be his third. It's also going to be his maximum number of grit because he has a max grit of three. It's a good idea to keep track of who killed what and how many, like I'm doing here. Chase just killed three stranglers because there are things in town that allows you to trade in these, I guess, bounties for money. All right, that was pretty epic. Chase did really well for his first fight. And wow, that pistol, the judge, was very handy. Um, so that's it for the hero's turns, and, and that's it for all of the monster activations. We're not done with the fight, but that's the end of the turn. And we'll start the next turn again with the Hold Back the Darkness test. All right, guys, I think we had some pretty good turns in. I'm going to call it a night here. I hope you guys will join me in the future episodes of this series because this is a great game. I, I love how thematic it is, everything makes sense, and the between adventures town type of you know leveling up, buying stuff, upgrading is just very comprehensive and awesome. So I want to show you guys that later in the series. Um, so hopefully you guys will tune back in for the future episodes of Shadows of Brimstone.